All right. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Uh, my name is Jesse. I'm with Lush Life Productions. Welcome to the first class of the 2024 Canadian Whiskey Certification Program. And I'm joined by some really incredible people. Um, if you haven't done this class with us before, there's just a couple things that we want to keep you in, in mind for you. I uh, Make sure you take advantage of that comment section, say hello, start to get to know all the people within this class for you. Um, I'm joined today with Gina Fawcett in the Trade and Education Manager for Corby Canadian Whiskies and Dave Mitten, who is the Global Brand Ambassador also for Corby Canadian Whiskies. Uh, in the in-depth workshops that you guys all get to see, uh, this one is being brought to the masses and then there are other ones that are just for the 100 members that are part of the cohort for our 2024 class. Uh, we're gonna kick things off today with the influences of Canadian whiskey category from the historical end of life and crucial figures as to why this category is so special and so important. We'll also start looking at the regulations and the growth over time. And this is a category that is very special, not just to us, but to a lot of people, but not a lot of people know about it. So we might as well just ask the experts. Um, just to keep in mind, we also have Ricky Ramirez here. If you want to say hi to Ricky. For a lot of our people that we opened up the uh, the program to, we really wanted to make sure we were offering it to everybody. So Ricky is here to translate anything that you need to know in Spanish. If you have any questions from our Spanish speaking uh, classmates, please send those into the chat. We'll make sure that those get translated for you from Gina and Dave at the appropriate point in time. But anything that you need to know, please just give us a holler. And like I said, take advantage of that comment section. Uh, last couple of things before I be quiet <laughs> is make sure to like us on Facebook, subscribe to the YouTube channel, follow us on Instagram, and please, please, please ask as many questions as possible because this should be interactive and fun. And we're just going to go ahead and kick it away to Gina and Dave. So See you in a little bit. Thanks so much, Jesse. And thanks to everyone joining us today outside of our 100 students. We're really excited to do this. It's our third year in a row with the ABCs of Canadian Whiskey. Uh, I've been at this role for almost 10 years. Uh, and Gina has been along my side most of the time, putting up with me. Uh, the first <laughs> thing we realized working with Canadian Whiskey and bartenders and aficionados around the world was no one knew anything about the category and a lot of misinformation and false truths out there. So we've tried to develop many different ways on how we can educate uh, consumers and bartenders alike. And this has turned into one of our best assets, a four week course on the complete history production. You get to work with us, our head distiller, master blender, uh, the complete workshop for the certification is a total of 13 hours, though, and that goes really in depth. But what we're going to share the next couple of weeks for an hour every week is with Gina and I today and Ricky. So I'm going to hand this over to Gina and let the ball will start rolling. All right, let's roll the ball. Uh, welcome, everybody. And like Dave said, we're super excited. Year three, here we are. Uh, another class of 100 uh, bartenders, plus everyone joining us uh, from wherever you are to learn more about Canadian whiskey. So we're gonna dive in today uh, on history. And we're gonna start with some historical dates. So I'm gonna bring up a timeline and we're gonna take you really through prohibition today. Uh, so let's start in the 1700s. Uh, the Scottish Highland Clearances, this was a time when a lot of Scottish tenants were being kicked off their land, and they didn't know where to go. And they, a lot of them came to North America. And that being said, uh, what they brought with them was their ability to distill and make whiskey and spirits. We all know that the Scotch have been doing that for a long time and they brought those skills with them to Canada. So that's kind of the beginning of where we see um, Canadian whiskey start to, to have a life. And then we're gonna jump to 1776. So this was the American Revolutionary War. And as we all know, the Americans were fighting the British uh, and America won that war, right? Now, after the war, all the British that were on American soil fighting, what were they going to do? 
where were they going to go? It wasn't just a quick plane ride home, you know, like today. It was a long journey to get back to England. So a lot of the British loyalists moved. They didn't want to be in, the, in, the, in, the, in America, in the United States. So they moved up to Canada. Now, why is that important? You're going to find out very soon that the English were some of the biggest influencers on Canadian whiskey and and how they distilled whiskey and and their distilling of wheat and those techniques really influenced the category into its evolution and what it's become today. So that English migration just from American soil after the war, those British loyalists really did have an influence on our whiskey making in Canada. Then we have the French Revolution and the Napoleonic War. Uh, we see a brandy shortage during this time period. What's, what's everyone to do? Look to whiskey, right, for their drinking needs. And they were getting this from all, all sorts of countries, you know, Scotland, Ireland, um, but certainly Canadian distillers were shipping their whiskey over uh, across the ocean to fill that brandy shortage gap. And then the early to mid 1800s, now this is where we see a huge influx of English migration uh, into Canada. This was called the Great Migration. And there were over 800,000 English that migrated to Canada during this time. Again, the English having that huge influence on bringing their skills and their knowledge on how to distill wheat which grew very well in Canada, still does, um, really impacted what the flavor profile would become. Now we're gonna jump past those mid 1800s. We're still in the mid 1800s, but on the other side of it, uh, to the American Civil War. In the States, we now have the Northern States fighting the Southern States, right? And territories. The lines were drawn a little differently back then, but most of your distilleries were found in the Southern states. Was the South going to share their whiskey with the North? Absolutely not. Of course not, it's wartime. So the Northerners decided, we'll go to Canada and get whiskey. They've got plenty. And here's where we see the biggest growth period in Canadian whiskey, the mid 1800s. And that's because we, we see a temperance movement right before this leading up to 1850s, really gaining some momentum into the Civil War. The North have, finding a shortage on where to find whiskey. They go to Canada through the mid to late 1800s, by the end of that century, the United States had become the biggest customer of Canadian whiskey and still is today. Jumping into the 1900s, American Prohibition. Now, most people would think the biggest growth period of Canadian whiskey was during Prohibition. All the movies, all the glamour, all the drama that we've been told, that is when the biggest growth period certainly must have been of Canadian whiskey, but it actually wasn't. It was the mid to late 1800s because of that civil war. During prohibition as a category, when we're talking about the category, the full category of Canadian whiskey, you know, if your biggest customer can no longer legally purchase your product, the US, you've got a big problem. And most distilleries shut down. They did not survive this time period in Canada. Now, of course, there were a few, and we're going to talk about some of them today, uh, that not only survived, but thrived during this time period. That's where the, all of those stories come from, right? But as a category, for the most part, Canadian whiskey did not do well through, through American prohibition. Now, after prohibition, you know, Canada had lots of aged whiskey. The U.S. did not. And so, again, we see a, a big growth period kind of take off with Canadian whiskey because we had lots in store. 
our biggest customer can now purchase again legally. And so uh, business is once again booming. Let's talk about a traditional style. What does that mean? What, what is the style of Canadian whiskey? Well, there's a lot of history to this and what it's kind of become known as. So pictured here on the left is Thomas Molson. He was the first commercial distiller in Canada of the Molson family. Molson's beer, we all, we're all you know familiar with. Same family. He kind of sidetracked, did his own thing, uh, went into distilling. He was English. He was distilling wheat, much like most of those, those English distillers knew how to do, right? Uh, so he was our first commercial distiller. And through the 1800s, not only do we see this giant English migration, but we also see the Germans migrating on the coast, primarily, East Coast, much like they did in the US, bringing with them their techniques, their knowledge on distilling rye. And on the West Coast, because there was a gold rush in California, and after that gold rush, people went to the gold rush near Vancouver. And so the, the Germans went up the coast. Now, in the 1800s in Canada, there was a train system being built, connecting all of these major cities from east to west, connecting people. Now we see in many industries, innovation, whiskey as well, lots of innovation taking place. And so we see this English, these English commercial distillers who are distilling wheat. And let's think about wheat as a grain. It's a, a lighter, softer, think of it as bread, lighter, softer, slightly sweeter grain, right? Now they're starting to put in just a little bit of rye, big, bold, spicy grain, five to 10%, making a blend mostly wheat, five to 10% rye. So if you were lucky enough at that time to go to a bar or a saloon and there'd be two barrels of whiskey on the back bar, you would either order a whiskey, which was 100% wheat, or you would order a rye, which was primarily wheat with just a little bit of rye, but it changed the flavor profile just enough Okay, and so to this day, you know, quite often everyone knows Canadian whiskey for, you know, being synonymous with rye. But what does that mean? It actually doesn't mean it has a ton of rye in it. It can. We produce 100% rye whiskeys, but it doesn't have to. And that traditional style is really lighter, softer, sweeter, and maybe just a little bit of rye to give just the edge of spice. Now, eventually, the Canadians got their hands on corn from the US uh, and, and began growing it themselves. Uh, a lot of distilleries switched over from wheat to corn. You'll see that today in, in most Canadian whiskeys, not all, but a lot of them have switched over to corn. Corn grows very well, um, the technology of grains and, and hybrids and whatnot, but it also has a higher starch content. So you're, you're getting a lot more alcohol out of it um, a lot more yield than of whiskey at the end of the day. And corn is still lighter, softer, sweeter. So kind of maintaining a bit of that flavor profile. I'd say it's sweeter than wheat. Um, and really, again, just adding a tiny bit of rye. The first distilleries in Canada to use corn, uh, to distill corn into whiskey, was the Hiram Walker Distillery, which is located in Windsor, Ontario, right across the river from Detroit, and the J.P. Weiser Distillery, which was in Prescott, Ontario, right across the border from upstate New York. So their proximity to the border and their ability to get corn allowed them to be the first distillers to um, be making with Canadian whiskey with corn. So again, today, when we refer to a traditional style or what most people would think of as the style of Canadian whiskey, if they're just calling a Canadian whiskey at the bar, it's primarily corn and maybe a touch of rye, lighter, softer, 
sweeter. Now let's go into some people that highly influence the category. These are the people we call our whiskey barons. This is not an exhaustive list by any means, um, but these are the people that influence the whiskeys that we'll be trying throughout the course, okay? So first we have William Guterham, who's pictured there, uh, and his brother-in-law, who we do not have a picture of, unfortunately, uh, James Warts Sr. Then we have J.P. Weiser, Henry Corby, and Hiram Walker. So Mr. Guterham and Mr. Warts, uh, they were English. Again, here's that English influence. They moved to the town of York, present day downtown Toronto. They were grain millers. They took in grain, they milled it down, they gave it back to farmers, bakers, whoever needed it. But you know, it was a bartering system at the time. Money existed, certainly currency, but really, People bartered for the most part. And so for payment, a lot of farmers would just leave behind an agreed upon amount of milled grain or flour, uh, 10%, something around there, but whatever was agreed upon in their contract. And that was their payment. And they would sell it to in their grocery stores and to, to bakers and as much as they could. But they really, they were good at this and they began stockpiling a lot of this milled grain and it started rotting. So naturally they wanted to do something to preserve this and they started distilling whiskey in 1837. So this is when they distilled their first whiskey uh, in downtown Toronto. And they, they were men of innovation. They were businessmen. And one of their employees, Mr. Riley, uh, created a still. Now, up until this point, and we'll get into this in production next week on different uh, distillation styles. But up until this point, they were really just single column pot distilling whiskey. And it was pretty bold and harsh. They certainly didn't have the techniques that we have today. Um, or the technologies in distillation that we have today. So it was, you know, it was a bit harsh. And Mr. Riley created a double column still, which was the first double column distilled whiskey in Canada. And they, they patented the Riley still in 1846. And now when you double column distill something, you're really removing a lot of those harsh qualities. You're making a very light, soft whiskey Again, let's think of that traditional style even to today. That's really what Canadians became used to. They loved that very palatable, very soft, very light style of whiskey. And biggest growth period, mid 1800s, right? These guys were set up for success going into that. By 1877, Guterham and Wart's Distillery in downtown Toronto was the largest distillery in the world. And Dave's going to give you a little more history on these guys uh, when you do the tasting today. Next up is J.P. Weiser. Now, he was, uh, he lived in New York. He was an American. Um, but his uncle had a distillery in Prescott, Ontario. Now, he was a cattle breeder. And he came to learn that when he bought the spent grain from a distillery and it was very high quality, now that spent grain has a lot of nutrients left over in it. We took out what we needed for whiskey, but it's got some other great stuff in it, especially for animal feed. And what he came to realize is that if he purchased the spent grain at a high quality, his cattle were bigger and better. And he was a very successful cattle breeder across the United States. He had ranches as far west as Kansas, as far south as Florida. And so his uncle had this distillery. He moved to Canada, started working in his uncle's distillery, really with the interest in the spent grain, purchased the distillery because he wanted the spent grain. Uh, whiskey was sort of even though it was the main product of the distillery, sort of a side business for him at the time. But it grew. Here we are again, right before the Civil War, 
leading up to this biggest growth period. And we saw the first bottles of J.P. Weiser's in the U.S. at the Chicago's World Fair in 1893. And it, it ended up becoming the third largest uh, distillery in the world eventually. So very successful J.P. Weiser. Henry Corby, again, English, uh, he moved to Belleville, Ontario. He was a baker. He was also a grain miller. He also transported grain up and down the waterways. So he had many businesses. Uh, and he, again, this bartering system had a lot of leftover grain that he didn't want to spoil. So he began distilling in 1859 at Alma Mills, which eventually became known as the Corby Distillery. And by 1882, the town surrounding the distillery became known as Corbyville because of his influence. And finally, Hiram Walker, another American who moved to Detroit. He was a grocer. And, you know, the history of many blenders is that not all, but a lot of them back in this day, especially, started as grocers. And that's because farmers and the people around the community, again, this bartering system, they were bringing in whatever they had to exchange for groceries. Now, farmers had leftover grain, so they were distilling whiskey on their farms, bringing the whiskey in. Hiram Walker was like, this one's great. This one's not. I have to make great whiskey because I have to sell this. I need a profit, right? So he became a blender in his grocery store um, to make a consistent, sellable, high quality product of the time. But he became very interested in making his own whiskey. So by 1858, he decided to open the Hiram Walker Distillery, which is in Windsor, Ontario, not Detroit, Michigan. In 1858, there are a few reasons why you would not open a distillery in Detroit or in the United States. Not a great business decision. Number one, that temperance movement that I mentioned earlier. We weren't at prohibition yet, but there was a huge temperance movement that had gained a lot of momentum. And if you thought that prohibition was around the corner, there's no way you would open a distillery. If your business could be shut down, why would you do that? So looking across the river, he decided to build his distillery there. The other reason is the Civil War. There was chatter about this, the Civil War. We talked about war in those days for years before it really came to fruition. Um, another reason, you know, your, your distillery all of the equipment could be melted down for ammunition and war materials. Your workers will need to go to war. You just won't have business. Uh, you will probably have to shut down. So another reason not to open in Detroit at that time. So he opened in Windsor, Ontario, right on the river. The distillery is still there today. Today, it has grown to be one of the largest distilleries in North America. And you'll get to see some of the insides of that uh, in the coming weeks and how, how whiskey is made at Hiram Walker. Next step is aging whiskey. So in history, this comes as a surprise to a lot of people, but Canada was the first country to mandate a minimum aging requirement. Most people I talked to, myself included, I thought it was Scotch. Scotch is old. Of course it's Scotch. Maybe it's Irish. Canada? But it is. Canada was the first country to mandate a minimum aging requirement. So let's look at the evolution of that. Remember that biggest growth period? I keep saying it. Mid-1800s, right? During that time, we're seeing, just like we are today, a lot of distilleries coming to life, popping up. We've got micro distilleries, macro distilleries, craft distilleries, 
mid-sized distilleries, you, you name it, we've got distilleries coming to life all over the place every day, it seems. And that, that's what was happening in Canada. By the end of the 1800s, we had over 200 distilleries in Canada. Now, our whiskey barons, our big producers, they saw that the little guys were taking a little chunk out of their business. And they didn't like that so much. Now, these guys also were very influential in their communities. They were politicians. They built, you know, buildings and lots of businesses. Uh, they were quite involved. And so they decided and they convinced all the lawmakers that Canadian whiskey needed a standard, a quality standard. And it really did because people were kind of doing whatever they wanted. And now there was no expectation to what Canadian whiskey should be if you buy a bottle. So by 1887, they mandated a one-year aging law. All Canadian whiskey will, ha will have been aged for one year. That puts one quality standard on the whiskey, but it also takes out the small guys. The small guys can't afford to hang on to inventory for an entire year before they sell it. Cash flow. They need the cash flow. That is, it's so hard. And that took out a lot of the business. Not quite enough, because a couple years later, they moved to a two-year minimum requirement. And by 1900, we went from over 200 distilleries to less than 20 in Canada. 1974, they updated the aging laws to a three-year minimum age requirement for Canadian whiskey. If you're familiar with scotch and their aging laws, Canadian whiskey and scotch's aging laws are exactly the same. So you know them both. Great. Now let's go back to prohibition. I told you we were gonna talk about this a little, and here we are. So this gentleman is Harry Hatch. And Harry Hatch owned a bar in Oshawa, Ontario, right there on Lake Ontario. His main customers at the bar were fishermen that went back and forth between upstate New York and Oshawa, and they came to his bar. He also was a salesman for Corby, who was owned at the time by Mortimer Davis. So prohibition hits and Harry Hatch decides, I'm going to quote unquote, employ these fishermen to take back cases upon cases of Corby whiskey and sell it in the States illegally, of course. And he did. And he was so successful. Corby was one of the very few distilleries right off the bat. Sales were great. So he goes to Mortimer Davis and says, hey, I'm doing all of this for you. I want a piece of the pie. And Mr. Davis says, nope. So he quits. He takes out a loan. And he purchases a Guterham and Wurtz distillery. Moves all that business over to Guterham and Wurtz. Massively successful. Corby is very quickly plummeting. He's so successful that only three years later, he not only pays off his loan, but he purchases the Hiram Walker distillery for $14 million in cash. It was actually valued at $28 million. You got to steal. Hiram was in a little legal trouble. But he was able to purchase it for $14 million in cash in only three years in the 1920s. Again, success continues. So he goes back to Mortimer Davis and says, I'm going to buy Corby from you, which he does. At that time, Mortimer Davis had purchased the J.P. Weiser's distillery and moved all of that production to Corby. Therefore, Harry Hatch now also owned the J.P. Weiser's production. Today, all of those brands 
and their stories and their histories are produced and told at the Hiram Walker Distillery in Windsor, Ontario. Okay, so let's go back to our timeline one more time, where we started. So you can see where all of these influencers, our whiskey barons, um, really influenced the category. So Thomas Molson, he actually, his business didn't last very long. Um, so, but there he is. He, he started the whole thing commercially for Canada. And then you can see leading into that biggest growth period, the mid 1800s, right up to that civil war, we've got these guys ready for success, right? By 1887, we start the aging requirements. By 1900, the big five, which actually includes Mr. Seagram and Sam Bronfman um, and their business, but they controlled the market. Five distilleries controlled the market by 1900. And then we get to prohibition. And this is where Harry Hatch comes into play. Purchased Gooderman Warts in 1923, Hiram Walker in 1926, and then by 1932, he got Corby's Distillery and the J.P. Weiser's brand, and he was set up for after prohibition as well with all of those brands and distilleries. Okay. I'm going to pass it to Dave to do a couple of tastings, uh, one on a traditional style like we talked about, and one uh, from Gooder mm -hmm. Awards. Thank you, Gina Fawcett. Um, I hope you all find that as fascinating as we do, because that's not something here in Canada we learned growing up through school, the history of Canadian whiskey and how the makers and the producers helped build our country. So it's quite fascinating. Uh, as Gina said, we're going to do tasting of two whiskeys right now. We're going to start off with the J.P. Weiser's 10-year-old. And for those of you um, that are more interested in J.P. Weiser's, as Gina talked about, as she said, gentleman from Trenton, New York, that made his way to Prescott, Ontario, here in Canada, uh, to open a distillery, technically buy a distillery, start producing whiskey. But his main reason for this wasn't to produce the whiskey. His first business was he was a cattle farmer. Uh, he had ranches across North America and Ontario, Florida, Texas, Kansas. Uh, he had six, 60,000 heads of cattle at one point. He was so successful. Uh, first person in North America to sell to the UK. And no one at the time really knew why he had cattle larger than most. He was very successful. His cattle were huge, well-fed. We have some of his notebooks from the early days at our distillery, which is pretty cool. And he had figured out, we don't really know how, but he had figured out what is very common practice today. When he would buy grain to produce and make whiskey, he'd use that grain afterwards when it's full of proteins and he would feed that to his cattle, his livestock. And they grew to be larger than average cattle just eating normal grain. So, Really smart business guy. Uh, also, he was turned the J.P. Weiser Distillery within a few years into the third largest distillery in Canada, producing over 500,000 gallons a year. And he put out the first bottle of J.P. Weiser's at the Chicago World Fair in 1893. Uh, and it was one of the first bottles to be labeled. So to think of J.P. Weiser's, I'd say a lot of you on this call are not familiar when you see this bottle, perhaps you hear the name, but this brand is older than some whiskeys like Jack Daniels. Just crazy to think. And we've just always only been sold in Canada. And now we're starting to get out into the U.S. and overseas and U.K. and Europe and trying to make our mark. So we're pretty excited. Um, on that note, we should try a little if you haven't already had mm -hmm. it. Um, for those of you, I'm assuming everyone's call is used to tasting whiskey. You've tasted whiskey before. Uh, if not, I mean, it's pretty simple. You've got a glass. If you've got a smaller stemmed glass, like I do here to keep the aromas in the glass is very nice to start off with. You can give it a little swirl that agitates it. It's not wine. You don't need to swirl it around, but it'll have the aromas come up to the top of the glass. Now, first thing I like to do is take a look at it. 
And I mean, this JP Weiser's 10 year old, as Gina stated, is a traditional style whiskey. So simply put, it's a soft corn whiskey that's been column distilled twice. It has a larger amount of rye grain that's been distilled once, column distilled, blended into it. That's three different distillates, two corn, one rye, three different types of casks, new American oak, ex-bourbon casks, and Canadian whiskey casks, which are essentially ex-bourbon casks once we've used them and we'll use them over and over. Now we'll go into distillation, aging in a lot greater detail down the road, but right now we're going to try it. So looking at it, I'm just seeing this beautiful, rich amber whiskey. I'm going to take it up to my nose. Little hint too, sometimes when you open your mouth a little bit and inhale, you're going to get a lot of the aromas. It's complex. I get a lot of honeycomb toffee off this little bit of the dried fruits from the bourbon cast, certainly some vanilla from the new American oak, a lot of rye spices. And then little subtle tones of like green apple. Now, first sip. Roll it around your tongue if you like. Taste it. Really taste it. Um, smooth. It's full. Uh, it's a really nicely balanced whiskey. Now, I mean, right away, I feel the like roasted rye spices. Uh, you get all the compliment smoothness from the warming vanilla. Uh, a lot of toffee, caramel on this. I actually get almost like a creme brulee when I try this whiskey. Now, if you don't get any of that, you're not wrong because we're all going to smell and taste different things. It's why almost tasty notes are a little ridiculous because everyone's going to pick up something unique mm -hmm. on their own. Um, now, this whiskey is beautiful to sip on its own. We love to watch things happen naturally. So at bars and restaurants around the world where this is sold, we're seeing... People pair it with boiler makers with lighter styled beers. We're seeing highballs with soda water, ginger. Uh, we're seeing lighter classic cocktails like stone fences with a light hard apple cider mixed with this. It's beautiful. Um, but I hope you enjoy it. Any questions on it right now? Mm -hmm. Anything, anything anyone's tasting or smelling that I haven't brought up? I see warm custard. That's a nice one. I see someone's asking about my painting. <laughs> Monique's asking, that's a painting of the first bar I ever opened. It was an old butcher shop from the 1920s in um, uh, Toronto. So it reminds me every morning of a lot of mistakes I made in the first bar I ever opened. Good times, though. <laughs> Honey graham crackers. I like that. Mm, why is the whiskey lighter? I say I feel like usually 10-year-old bourbons are pretty dark. True. True. Uh, the whiskey, I I'll take I'll take this a, li a little bit, and if you want to add to it, Dave, but it's made very differently than most of your bourbons are going to be made. Most bourbons are made in a single column distillation. And we're going to get into those differences and, and how they bring forth different flavors. Uh, like Dave said, the 10 year old here is double column distilled corn. So when you double column distill it, that second column distillation is going to strip out a lot of the grain and yeast character and let the maturation shine through a little bit more. So it is very light and very soft, um, whereas a bourbon is going to be very grain forward, right, uh, from that single column distillation. All right, let's let's uh, let's head into Gooderham and Warts. Let's do it. All right, so Gooderham and Warts, a little bottle here. This is where I say, uh, and this is one you won't find everywhere. It's honestly, it's one of my favorite whiskeys we produce, uh, talking to different whiskey writers around the world. It's one of the favorite whiskeys we put out, but it's not commonly found everywhere. It's not huge in sales. I kind of find it's got a cult following of bartenders. Um, uh, and same as Gooderham and Warts. It, again, as I was kind of 
joking that we don't learn about whiskey history growing up in school. Uh, Gooderham and Warts had a lot to do with the building of Canada, as many of our whiskey ambassador whiskey ambassadors, our whiskey barons. Um, <laughs> Gina mentioned they came over from, from Suffolk, England, uh, arrived in the town of York, which is downtown Toronto in 1932. Now, most of you that are unfamiliar with Toronto, Canada. I Hold mean, on. 1832. Sorry. What did I say? 1832. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Just in case. That 10-year-old <laughs> went right to my head. Um, <laughs> if you're unfamiliar with Toronto, I mean, I'm not from here, but I've lived here over 20 years, so I'm kind of a local now. Uh, it's a big city, bigger than most people realize, like fourth largest in North America. New York, Los Angeles, and Mex Mexico City are bigger than Toronto. We have 240 official and unofficial neighborhoods. It's a big place. And in those neighborhoods, one of one of them is called the Distillery District. And what it is, is it is the old distillery that Gooderham and Wartz opened up. And as Gina said, they became the largest in the world by 1877. Now that it had become defunct and closed down, it was refurbished as an entire neighborhood in Toronto. It is pretty wild. So when you visit Toronto, live here, um, You'll see that we tore a lot of our old buildings down and put up in glass and steel, which I don't agree with, but I'm not in charge. The distillery district is still one of the neighborhoods that you can walk back in time and feel like you're in 1832. A lot of American movies are filmed there, period pieces. Um, it's a really special place. Now, they also had a lot to do with the building of Canada. They were our first taxpayers. So imagine that. And then the rest of our taxpayers, the originals, were the Canadian whiskey barons. So all the money made from Canadian whiskey went into building our highways, railroads, our cities. Canadian whiskey helped build Canada. Um, even today, if you look at a lot of our old Victorian red brick buildings around the city, the few that are left, and churches, they were built by Gitterham and Warts. Like, they had a lot to do with the city of Toronto. It's just not common knowledge. Now... The whiskey, when we brought this back, and Dr. Don, our master blender, who you're going to meet, wanted to do an ode to dis Gooderham and Warts. They were originally grain millers that turned into distillers. They were the guys you'd bring your grain to, they'd make a flour, they would buy some off of you, they'd sell it in their grocery stores, make a profit, but they were so successful and accumulating so much flour they made, they couldn't sell it fast enough. Rot would settle in, rodents would get into it, and they were throwing money down the drain. So the idea came to start producing whiskey. And this is how they came to be. Um, now, this whiskey is a four grain, and that's very uncommon for Canadian whiskey. I'd even say for North American whiskey. You don't see a lot of four grains, especially when we put this out. Um, so you look at it, and it's it's a luxurious gold, probably a little lighter than the JP Weisers we just had. Um, it's very complex because being four grain, it's actually seven distillates. So it's seven finished whiskeys blended together to make one whiskey. And now right away, this is one I walk through from the nosing to sipping all of the grains. I get a breadiness from the wheat, fresh baked, fresh, fresh baked bread. I get a little bit of nuttiness from the barley, touch of honey, a little bit of raisin. First sip, this is full, it's round, it's soft, but it's really round. It coats your mouth. You feel it going down. I love it. Now, I get the barley mold. I get the fresh bread. I certainly get the oak flavor. This is 90% new American oak, 10% ex-bourbon cast. You're going to get a lot of the warming vanilla, toffee, caramel, dried fruits. Um, and it is... A four grain with a master blender who's got a scientific sense of humor. He bottled it at 44.4 ABV or 88.8 .8 proof. Um, this is beautiful on its own. Great sipper. Just neater on the rocks. But again, watching things happen naturally. One thing, certainly in Toronto, you see a lot of bartenders use this 
old Toronto whiskey to make Toronto cocktails. Um, one of the nicest I've ever had is one of our students today, Andrew Toplack, introduced me to a Toronto cocktail with some Tempest Fugit Fernet Angelico, and that is a stunning Toronto cocktail. Also, the other cocktail we use for this is, it's a little cheeky because I have no proof of it, but the first recorded whiskey sour in writing was at a Toronto saloon in 1856. So I'd like to think, we would like to think, that the local distillery, Gooderham and Warts, putting out whiskey since 1837 was probably the whiskey they were using in that sour. I got no proof. It's a nice story, though. So we'll use this whiskey in a lot of whiskey sours and uh, Toronto cocktails. Any thoughts? I like the granola, honey and granola. That's good. Mm -hmm. Definitely fruitcake. Dried fruits. No, you don't want me as prime minister. Though it would be fun. Well, should we head into category regulations? I just am, am conscious of our time. Let's do it, Professor. All right. If you have any questions or comments on what we've already gone through or any of the tastings, just put them in the comment section uh, and we'll get to them. If we don't get to them today, you know, we will be emailing our group of 100 students uh, any answers to any questions that they might have. So uh, get those in the comments. Here we go. Category regulations. So first we're going to talk we're, and you're going to see me do this a lot through the course, uh, comparing Canadian whiskey to American whiskey, uh, because that's where a lot of our misconceptions come from. You know, a lot of people think, well, it's, I don't know why, but it should be made the same as American whiskey, but nobody thinks that about another Scotch or Irish or Japanese whiskey. So I'm not really sure why, but it is where a lot of our misconceptions come from. So by regulation, we're going to look at the categories. In Canada, there is only one regulated category of whiskey, okay? If we compare that to the United States, there's over 36. If you go through the TTB manual, it's a little odd to count them the way that they're listed and categorized. Certainly over 36. Um, and more coming, as we all know, American single malts, those regulations are coming to life as we speak, which is awesome. Um, but that, that to say, each, you know, each one has their own set of rules over here. In Canada, all whiskey labeled Canadian whiskey in any form follows the same set of rules. It is called Canadian whiskey, Canadian rye whiskey, or rye whiskey. So you see how important that little bit of rye has become in the style of Canadian whiskey, right? And I'm not gonna list all the American whiskey categories because that's not why we're here. Um, but both countries recognize and adhere to international whiskey categories and their regulations. So what that means is if you buy a scotch in Canada, that scotch adheres to all of Scotland's regulations. Or in the U.S., if you buy an Irish whiskey, it is adhering to all Irish whiskey regulations, okay? In Canada, Canadian whiskey is the national spirit. In the U.S., bourbon is what we call our native spirit here in the U.S. Okay, so next up is our regulations. Here's our major rules must be made from cereal grain. This is like across the board, world whiskey regulations, cereal grain makes whiskey. Okay, corn, wheat, rye, barley, etc. Those are your four most popular, but that's how you're making whiskey, from cereal grain. Must be aged in wooden barrels, less than or equal to 700 liters, for a minimum of three years. Okay, now 700 liter barrels are giant. I, I, I don't know of anyone doing that, but maybe they are, they can. Uh, minimum of three years, like I said, we're following all Scotland's uh, regulations when it comes to maturation or setting them. Uh, 
but any type of wood it doesn't say new wood doesn't say charred wood it could be reused it could be oak it could be cherry it could be lots of things red oak um so it doesn't say what type of wood must be mashed fermented and distilled and aged in canada that seems obvious it's canadian whiskey however again comparing to the us you don't always have to do that you know in the us by regulation we can purchase let's say a rye whiskey that that is made in canada ship it to the us age it here and label it a straight american rye whiskey Although the whiskey was not made in the U.S., it was aged here and bought by a U.S. company, um, but by regulation, to be labeled a rye whiskey in the U.S. or straight rye, we wouldn't have to do all the production in the U.S. In Canada, for a Canadian whiskey, that production all has to happen in Canada. Must be bottled at a minimum of 40% ABV. Now this again is kind of standard across the board. There's a few exceptions, um, but all major whiskey categories, 40% is the minimum ABV. May contain spirit caramel for coloring. I don't know why, but a lot of distilleries, a lot of brands don't like to talk about this. I don't know, but it can. In fact, all whiskey categories, except for your straight American whiskeys, straight bourbon, straight rye, etc., can. Regular bourbon, regular rye, scotch, Irish whiskey, Canadian whiskey, we can all add spirit caramel for coloring. And why? Why do we do it? Because barrels age differently. They look a little different from one batch to the next sometimes. And if I go to the store and I purchase a bottle of J.P. Weiser's, and then I say, ooh, I really like that. I'm going to get another bottle. And I go back to the store, and it looks different. My, I, I say, what is wrong? Something happened to this whiskey. They did something. Something is wrong with it. Just with my eyes, visually. Even though nothing is wrong with it. It tastes exactly the same. It just looks a little differently from how it aged. And then we have the 9.09% rule. Now this is very unique to Canada and where a lot of misconceptions come from. Um, so back when our, you know, our, our big Canadian growth, I keep going back to that, but we have lots of little distilleries popping up and, and people taking a lot of freedoms and um, exploring what they can do with their whiskey and how far they can make their product go maybe um starting to add some peculiar ingredients to lengthen their whiskey and the quality is going down to a degree and our whiskey barons you know they're all blenders they're all blending in things um but they're like we have to have some kind of standard here we want to set a precedent we just set a a one-year aging minimum requirement a two-year aging minimum requirement we also need to set a quality standard on what's in this bottle you know, and at that time, they were blending in things like cognac, rum, more expensive ingredients than the whiskey. And then some people were blending in just tea or color or sugar or Lord knows. It, it kind of went bonkers. Um, so they set a rule that up to 9.09% .09 of the liquid in the bottle can be either a wine or a minimum two year age spirit. So that is for every 100 liters, you could add another 10 liters of either minimum two year age spirit or a wine. Now, a lot of people, you actually don't see this rule go into effect a lot, some in Canada, but it's really to add flavor um, that they can't get consistently from a barrel. And a lot of times what we'll see is maybe a half a percent of something. You know, I, I haven't seen 9.09% .09 of another ingredient go in, um, but they can, they can go up to that. So just to set kind of a standard of what that can be, but cannot be anything other 
than a two-year age spirit or more or a wine. And I'm going to drive this home because we get a lot of questions or people who think that they know, but it cannot contain juice. It cannot contain sugar. It cannot contain neutral grain spirit. All of these things come up to Dave and I quite often. People are like, oh, well, they could just throw neutral grain spirit in there. They cannot. Not to be a Canadian whiskey. And I don't know this, but my perception of this, uh, knowing American whiskey regulations, is that, you know, th the lines have somehow gotten blurred. A lot of Canadian whiskey is known to be blended whiskey from our history and, and how we produce whiskey, which we're going to get into next week in more detail. But a lot of Canadian whiskey is blended whiskey. The regulations in the U.S. for blended whiskey allows for neutral grain spirit. Up to 80% of the bottle can be neutral grain spirit in an American blended whiskey. That is not the case in Canada. And so somehow, somewhere along the lines, I'm not sure where, but it feels to me like those that that it got a little blurry in what's what. Um, so none of these things are allowed in Canadian whiskey. Finally, we're going to talk about flavored whiskey, and we're really just going to touch on it because it is part of the category, um, but it's not really a focus of this course. So we're going to touch on it so you know really what the regulations to be a flavored whiskey is. Canada versus the U.S. again. So sweetening agents or sugar in Canada would have to have more than 2.5% or, or at least 2.5%, I should say. Uh, in the U.S., could have sugar or not. Uh, the ABV of a bottling of flavored whiskey in Canada has to be at least 23%. In the U.S., has to be at least 30%. And then this is like, there's, there's a lot of wiggle room here. Can contain natural or artificial flavorings, contains natural flavoring materials. What's defining natural and artificial flavorings and materials? There's some wiggle room there what that what that is. But they both can contain caramel coloring, of course. And then back to our juice and our sugar and our neutral grain spirit for flavored whiskey, they are actually okay to be in the blend. Okay. Okay, so that concludes category regulations. I'm gonna toss it back to Dave to give you a tasting on a 9.09 .09 example and uh, a flavored whiskey example. All yours, Dave. Thank you, Professor. Uh, and I'll be quick, so I know we're almost over. So we're <laughs> gonna bring up the JP Weiser's 15. Beautiful, I call this our crowd pleaser. Younger generations, older generations with different palates and, and seem to love this whiskey. So you look at it, dark amber, beautiful. Again, get that soft vanilla, warming vanilla, caramel toffee. A little bit of green apple on this. We'll get into that later on in the course, why we're getting the green apple, why I'm getting the green apple. Uh, soft and smooth. Now, tasting it, it's very delicate. It's sweet. You get that caramel, the toffee, warming rye, mature oak. But I almost get like a candied banana on this, too. That's me. Very traditional, like the 10-year-old J.P. Weiser's. This would even have less rye in it. It would be a majority of a soft double-column distilled corn, a little pinch of once-column distilled rye. And the 9.09 .09 rule Gina's talking about, none of the whiskeys we'll be drinking throughout this course We take do we take advantage of that rule, except the 15-year-old. We blend in less than a percent of a sherry into this whiskey. I think that's where I'm getting a little bit of the candied banana. Some people tell me they get tobacco. I would say that's where it's coming from. We'll we'll really get into the 9.09 .09 when we have our master blender, Dr. Don, come on. But we're limited on time today. I think it's a really fun rule. And again, we don't take advantage of it because it's actually cheaper to do barrel finishing than buy product and blend it in. But Don will get into that. I hope you like this one. It's beautiful on its own. And I have had people make me cocktails, but for the price, 
you're going to really sip this over ice or on its or neat. Um, next up, the JP Weiser's Old Fashioned. And as Gina said, we don't really get into the flavored whiskeys very often because we mainly work with bar and restaurants and whiskey geeks and aficionados, but there is a place for this. I mean, if you think of a bottled cocktail, if you want to bring a bottle of wine to a party, or you could bring 13 pre-made cocktails ready to go. Uh, I met a couple at a whiskey show last month who told me they always take a bottle on the weekend camping trips so they don't have to carry a few bottles of wine or beer. I thought it was pretty smart. Um, now, what's in this? It is three-year-old corn whiskey. There is 8% sucrose. We use from Red Path. We don't use fructose syrup at the distillery. Uh, beautiful bronze color. We work with a flavor house to mimic a very popular bitter and essence of orange. So it's very bronze. I mean, I get shaved rinds of orange and cinnamon on the nose right away. It's very smooth. It's very balanced. It's a sweet old fashioned. It's for a sure. sweet old fashioned. It's very it's Canadian lot. style. Yeah. It's <laughs> light corn. It's not a big heavy rye, which we'll get mm -hmm. into later in the course. But yeah, I get notes of honey and orange, a little mm -hmm. bit of rye bread. Some the reason we're tasting an old fashioned is not because this is whiskey flavored to be like old fashioned, an old fashioned cocktail, but like Dave listed the ingredients, it is an actual old fashioned. Um, but because there's sugar in it and other ingredients, it actually categorizes by regulation under a flavored whiskey. So just so you're aware of why we're tasting this for flavored whiskey. Yeah. Oh. And yes, I get lots of cinnamon too off this. So this is this is done really well for us. When we first put it out, I kind of turned my nose down the whole bottle of cocktails, but I got to follow the rest of the world. And uh, say it's big consumers, but there's there are some bars and restaurants in Toronto that I or in Canada that buy this by the truckload because they pour it into a keg and it is their old fashioned on tap. That happens. So it does well in the on trade as well as it does in the off trade thoughts all right well i think we are a little past our time so again if you have questions make sure you get them in the comments um because Jesse will make sure that we have them all and we get all of our students the answers to their questions uh so that nothing goes unanswered for you, but we're gonna pass it back to Jesse. That was so much fun. Um, again, <laughs> if y'all have any questions or any comments, please let us know. We'll make sure that those get directly to Gina and Dave. And if we need any help from Ricky, please let us know on that too. And we'll be back next week for another session here on our live stream. So please make sure you go through and like or love or follow at PDX or Camp Run Amok on the Instagram stuff. Follow Gina and Dave, please, and ask them tons of questions. We love bothering them. Uh, this will be recorded for our students, so just in case you need anything else, you can go back and see this one more time. But until then, we will see you next week. Thanks, All right. everybody. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>